Great offense, which uh, we're going to talk all about these, but uh, just so you know that these are out there. Um, so I, I was thinking about this this morning, reading about you going, well, where do I start with this? I think we need to start probably at the beginning. Take us back to where you were born and your early life. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Actually, oh, when I was born, I lived in the village. I did not know my father for a little bit. Because uh, what I mean for a little bit is like I didn't even know who my dad was. I, um, but my dad was looking for me. Um, and uh, I just saw in tourages of so many cars coming into a village where I was with my mother looking for me. And they said, oh, this. Then I, I noticed that this is the man I've watched before on TV. <laughs> Notice that's my father. Then afterwards, he took me now to his huge house and living from the village to his huge house. And then I began to discover myself who I really am. In the, in the process of that, in the process of the quest, for me, like trying to know myself. Then I had a man visit me around 3 a.m. in the night and he introduced himself as Jesus to me. At the same time, I was struggling with sore throat in my throat. There was a, a lot of pain in my throat. And when, when I saw him, that pain disappeared and that brought curiosity to try to know who is this Jesus is. And How old the, are you when this happens? That was around uh, nine going to ten. Okay, so you're nine years old. In the middle of the night, you're visited at three in the morning yeah. by a man who identifies himself as Jesus. Yes. And you had a sore throat that all of a sudden is gone. Disappeared. And, and uh, my grandparents were like chiefs, and in other ways, they are rulers like kings. Uh, so very influential grandparents um, living in that way of the villages. In Zambia we have uh, 72 tribes and every tribe has got a king and every tribe has got like a chief. Okay. So I come from all those two tribes. Ah. Yeah, so that's a, uh, that's a, that's, that's a story. So when, when now my dad took me at the same time he was working with the first president of Zambia his name was Dr. Kenneth Kawonde and at the same time they were directly working on the release of Nelson Mandela so my dad was very much involved in all that releasing Nelson Mandela together with the first president of Zambia Dr. Kenneth Kawonde so the history goes way <coughs> political on that come from the political family and um, the other side, um, our loyal blood. So I have all mix of everything, but the only things that I treasure now is the, the, the visitation of Jesus that I had that changed everything to the point where my dad who didn't even know the Lord, he said, um, okay, there's, there was something I did that was like uh, out, of the, out of the norm. Uh, we had workers and some of them, they came to complain to me that they needed food. Then I saw there was a lot of chicken in the fridge because, I mean, mm. they had, we had the biggest fridge, like <laughs> from there to there, there was full of nothing but chicken and uh, wild meat. Oh, you can tell all kinds of food. I mean, it's king's food, so what do yeah. you expect? So, so one day I took a couple of chickens and I gave it to the workers who were asking for for chickens because we had a lot of them. Then I started, I gave them away. And I remember my dad comes home and he says, you are a different son. This is your home. Yes, you, you have the right. Just like my other children, you did the right thing to give away the chicken <laughs> for meal. Then I said, wow, really? So that was like, he thanked me for being generous. So that was like uh, a, a, a great leader. And I, I know he, he adopted a lot of people that he, he paid for their school fees and, and high school. That was a type of my dad, apart from him being powerful and wealthy and influential, and you can name it, or 
the loyalties that you can tell. Um, but one time, I was in his room and he said, you are a godly child. I'm glad you are a godly child. He, he said this to you? Yeah, he said to me. And I never understood what really meant to me. He says, you are godly. He said God reached out to you? No, he said you are like, a God, like being godly, like you have the fear of God ah. upon your life. Then I didn't even know what he meant. He says, yeah, you have the fear of the Lord. And, and he wasn't even really Christian. He was, you know, he's a politician and a leader, you know. Leaders, they, they save all religions to try and keep the power. Right, right, you know? right, right. But, but he, he got that light, uh, right that I was a godly child. And that was really amazing and touching for me that he was able to accept my, my experience that I had with Jesus. So you told him about it? I told him about it. He's the only one that I told in the entire family. Really? The first person I really told uh, is when I was in the village, I told my grandfather. My grandfather around f uh, 4 a.m. in the morning, he had a locking chair. <laughs> Every morning he woke up, he was on that rocking chair. So I went there and mentioned the African language, said, Baba Namlola, yes, who means I've seen Jesus. Then he looked at me and said, I've heard about that name, but he says, okay, very good. He, he just tapped in my head and said, very good. That's very good. And, but he didn't make it like a big deal because he didn't know what to, he didn't know what to say. Can you imagine you're not a Christian and you never heard of anybody saying I've seen Jesus. Then your grandson is saying I've seen Jesus who doesn't even talk about Jesus at all. <laughs> This is unbelievable. So okay, so so your grandfather's on the rocking chair yes. at four a.m. and you tell him, grandfather, grandfather, I I've seen Jesus. Yes. And he said, I've heard that name. Yeah, I've heard about that name. But he just said good, but he didn't <laughs> didn't know what to say. He didn't know. What and what did you, how did your dad respond when you told him this? He said, I'm glad, that's a good thing. I'm glad you're a godly child. That's all he said. Uh, you're, I'm, I'm glad you're a godly child. Yeah, that's all he said. Because my dad's nature, he was, uh, he was a fighter for humanity. As you can see, he worked with the first president to liberate Zambia and many, and that's why many of my relatives today, they are in politics, even today. I don't want to mention their names, but they are all in politics. Uh, he, his heart was always to save humanity. And he, um, he valued that because no one talked about God except me. And the way I was talking about God was not like from the church. It's like, I saw Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And they, of course he knew I didn't lose my mind. And uh, if maybe he figured, because he figured that maybe it was a dream of some kind, but it, for me it was a reality and I was passionate about it. When I talked to him, I presented Jesus' stories, though I was speaking to a neighbor or to someone, I wasn't talking about all. It wasn't know, a religious It wasn't thing. religious and I, and I didn't even know if religion does exist because we, we didn't go to church, so I didn't know. You didn't even know about it? I didn't know about it. You're going to like this story. You know, there are so many things I could touch, but it's... Uh, uh, now, I got moved to my father's place. Uh, then they took me to school, uh, high school. Um, so when I was at school, there was people that they called the Gideon people. I didn't know who they are, but they called, they called themselves as American Gideon people. They were distributing Bibles. Mm -hmm. Then somebody whispered in my ear, said, Jesus is found in that book. Then I said, really? I've been looking for him. So <laughs> I went and like this, I can demonstrate like this. I just grabbed it and started learning. <laughs> <laughs> there was no he stole a Bible. I stole the Bible. <laughs> I stole the Bible. I was learning. And there was no one chasing me. And, and, and then, I, you know, that was like, then they said, God bless you. Have a nice time. I said, I just stole the Bible. It doesn't belong to me, you know. So I was, I put it in my, in my backpack and, and I went home. I, I went right straight into, into, into my room. 
and I rocked myself in, in the room. And, and uh, our, our chef, we had our personal chef, tried to knock, say, the food is ready, your favorite meal is ready. Then I said, I don't want to eat anything right now, I'm fine, just, just keep it away. He said, really, you always like this food when you can't. No, I don't want to eat because I was busy trying to find Jesus in those books. Like I couldn't, I, and, and the story short, it took months for me to start reading that book. I read, I read that book for so, so many times to the point where my English teacher said, are you religious of some kind? Your, your English writing is different now. I said, what? You're writing like a New King James Version. <laughs> Bible. <laughs> we don't we don't teach that. Where did English. you get this from? When did you get this this from? Do you have a private Twitter or some kind? I I said no. I said, but I don't I may or only English teacher I said yes, but I don't teach you that language. But I know. Then he said, I'm a Christian, I read the Bible. I know that type of the English is correct English, but it's it's not what we're teaching here. How old are you at this point in the story? Fourteen. 14. Yeah. And you're writing in the King James. King, King James, <laughs> because cause I was, that's a book I read every day, trying to figure out to find Jesus in those pages. And so what did you, what's, what's the first thing you can remember reading about him that you were like, that stuck out to you? Something miraculous happened when I read Mark chapter 16. I'll never forget that scripture. Mark chapter 16. I was reading from 11 and 12 and up to the 13, where it talks about you would tramp on the scorpions. I mean, my dad owns farms. So in those farms, there was a lot of scorpions and cobra. And that scripture was talking about a scorpion and cobra. Then uh, I said, the cobra, because I have faced cobra myself at the farm, at my dad's farm. Uh, I escaped many times from the cobra from not biting me. I, I had cobra that like, would stand up like this on me, and I would just go straight like, you don't, you don't wink or anything when you're with a cobra, just in case you miss the cobra. I don't know how the American cobra, are, but the African cobra, you have to be. Like we don't a, get a lot of cobra around here. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. I'm glad. I'm glad. That's why I moved. That's why I moved to California. It's been a while. Yeah. That's why too many cobras there. Yeah. That's why I moved to California. Yeah, you're good here. I'm good yeah. here. But but there I faced cobras a couple of times, and one of the time I remember facing a cobra, it's when I was come. I was just being dropped off from school with our driver, and uh, yeah, actually my. My friends, they, they dropped me off. And then, as I was going through into the farm, one of my dad's farm, there Cobra rose and stood up like this. And I remember the teachings, stay still. So I stayed still like this, no moving. It takes like a minute. If you don't move, it's gonna go away. Then you're not. Really? You, yeah. So I did that. But if you move, it can spit into your eyes or something, the cobra. It's dangerous like that. Uh, but that was a long time ago. Uh, so when that scripture in the book of Mark chapter 16 I was talking about you step on cobras, I was saying, no way a cobra is so deadly. So then it says... Uh, you lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. I remember using a, a Exford a dictionary to try and find what does it really mean to lay your hands. It says to place hands on someone. So in the class, when I went back to school in the classroom, there was a, my classmate who sat next to me he kind of went blind. His eyes had a problem, so he went blind and said, teacher, teacher, I want to go home. I can't see. Then I remembered what I read, and I pressed my hand. I didn't pray or that. And then he said, teacher, teacher, I don't want to go home. I can see now. So that sh shocked me. I was like, I, I didn't say anything, really. I, 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 
the school ended, I was just still in shock. I didn't tell him anything, I didn't say anything, and I didn't share anything. It just made me to go and read, read the Bible, that Gideon Bible like a madman now, because I saw like the first thing for the first time made the Bible alive. Now I was believing every page that I was reading. And now I was like reading it, said, okay, this happened. Everything, I just believed it with all my heart and all my being. I said, wow, because I have a memory that, that what I read that day healed somebody who was going blind. And I did not verbalize it, unverbalized. I did not share it to my brothers and, or to our workers or to the people that were around. Um, I didn't share this to anybody, but it was, it was the truth and the witness that only me I knew and I saw and I believed the Bible. From that very moment, something changed. I started understanding the Bible miraculously. From that, from that miracle that took place, also that same miracle happened in my mind. Every time I read the scripture, I understood it. And I remember... Revelation. I it was like revelation. Yeah, it's like a revelation to the point where a one pastor was asking me about scriptures and I told them the background and everything. They said, have you been to the Bible school? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you know the Bible more than pastors. Then I read the scripture in the book of Psalms. It says, you have made me, you have given me more insight more than my teachers. Then I said, this is what I was experiencing. And... Uh, The Bible became so much part of me to the point that at school I would have uh, my fellow students surround me. They say, tell us the stories about the Bible. No one, was, no one was doing anything like that. I would share about what I read in the book of Matthew, who Jesus is. I wasn't preaching. I was just sharing the story. Then after I finished sharing, everybody was in tears. Then I would say, why are you weeping? He says, that's amazing. We need this Jesus too. Then the numbers started increasing and increasing and increasing. And before you know, people at high school, they started calling me a boy preacher. <laughs> then I said, I'm not a preacher. He said, no, you're a preacher. It's now people started asking me to pray. I didn't know how to pray really. There's one miracle that happened. I got, I got invited to somebody's house. This man was sick, very sick for a long time. So they said, let's invite Gershom. He's going to pray. Then I said, but I've never prayed for the sick. He says, a lot of our friends have told us that when you're talking, they have been healed from headaches, stomach pains and all kinds. I didn't know that that was happening. I had a zero idea. And now they're taking me to somebody who is sick to pray for the person. I was like shaking out of fear. Like, I can't do that. I don't know how to pray. I've never done this. Then I heard the voice inside me say, lay your hands on him. Then I said, I don't know how to do that. Lay your hands on him. The third time I just stood, I said, okay, I'm going to lay my hands on you. Then when I placed my hand on him, then he said, I am fine. Can I have some food to eat? Then I was like, there was no words, nothing. Because I didn't know. I understand that. I, I knew the Bible, but I didn't know how to use the Bible. <laughs> it's just like, it was for me. It wasn't like to go and give it away. Then again, that miracle that took place, that healing miracle that took place for that military man. He was a military man. Then stories started going around. Stories. But the only thing that was very difficult for me, some Christians were saying, I cannot be saved because I'm coming from a very rich family. They said, it's very hard for a rich man, for rich man to enter the kingdom. And then I said, what do you mean? Sometimes the camel makes it through the eye of the needle. So they were telling me that was the only vase that I struggled with. But, but I think, but isn't that why Jesus came to appear to you? Yes. He appeared to me. I know I, I didn't know Jesus and then appeared to me. So a lot of our neighbors 
who were actually, some of them were workers at our farm. And uh, they were saying, you can't be, a, somebody said you cannot be a true Christian, but because, I mean, you have animals, you have sheep, you have, you have goats, you have cows, you have chicken, you have a big farm, you have a big house, you have cars, uh, you, you cannot. Your dad is like a big man, you know, you, you cannot, you cannot. And I, I struggled on that, but that was the only scripture I had a question on. But then when I read it, it says, it's impossible with man, man but not with God. Right. Then I said, not with God. Right. So it as is possible. As, if with I'm God. with God, yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> My family can be fine. People yeah. can become as... So that's why I wrote the book called Breakthrough Thinking. I didn't have a copy today because I ran out when I travel. Breakthrough Thinking came about because of that mindset in, in Christianity in Africa where they, they celebrate and promote poverty and they promote just going to heaven. And that's why a lot of wealthy people, they don't want to be part of that. And I understand now. My goodness. Do you remember what Jesus looked like to you? Oh, of course, I remember that. Like, now, I remember him even now. I, I, when Jesus truly appears to you, you can't forget. He has only appeared to me in that type of uh, unforgettable moment. I've seen him in meetings, but those are glimpses. Like, uh, like if these miracles are happening, I've seen him pass, but those are like flashes of light. Like, they're not so much. I cannot explain those ones. But the two times that I've seen him visit me, it's when I, when I was nine, going to a, to a ten, 10 years old. Uh, his eyes were so much full of compassion. The, his, his face was like crying for somebody compassionate to try to serve somebody. That's how he looked like. So much full with love and compassionate. I don't know how to explain it, but the second time he visited me was much more clear to explain it. The second time is when I, I decided because no one was serving God around me, so I thought I brainwashed myself. So I said, Maybe I'm reading too much the Bible and I'm talking about the Bible so much. Maybe I should take a break from it. Somebody advised me, take a break from these religious things. Pick them up when you're older. You're too young to be talking about these things. Then I said, ah, I think they are right. So when I was making that decision to stay away from the Lord and everything, and that very day that that man advised me to stay away from the Lord Jesus Christ and everything, he says, you have to have a normal life as a kid. Go and play soccer. Go and do that. You're always reading the Bible and sharing this. You are, you are too young to involve yourself to things like that. So when, um, when he told me that and it made sense, I was thinking about it and said, I think I'm going to stop. And then in the middle of the night, around 3 a.m., Jesus showed up. There was a, like a light. It, the whole lights were the, the house was pitch dark because we had turned off the lights. It was in the, you know, in Africa sometimes at 3 a.m. It's very dark because there isn't electricity everywhere. Only our farmer had electricity. It's like here, you know, it's, it's, we were covered with trees and forest. And so if you turn off the lights, you are really on the pitch dark. So I just saw light into the room came very bright. Then I started looking, I, I, I opened my eyes, I started looking at the light. As it came on that light, there was formed a face, the most beautiful face I will never forget. And the eyes were like framing fires of love in the form of tears, but framing fires of love in the form of tears. And then I felt that same love that was in, in Jesus begin to pierce my heart and I begin to weep and weep and weep and that's how the vision left. It wasn't a vision, it was like this. That's how it left and from that day I 
decided to follow Jesus, said, I don't care what everybody thinks. He came to me. I love him so much. I'm even willing to die for him. That's the very day I made that decision to say, I don't care if the world is against me or my own family is against me or my neighbor is against me. I don't care if the whole world falls apart. I will follow him. He loves me so much. And I became a whipping man from that very moment. I would whip when I think about how much he loves me and he cares for me. I did not call on him, but he came to me. And now the scripture came to me. I didn't, you did not choose me, but I chose you. For God so loved the world, even before we loved him, he came. I did not deserve his love, but he, he showed me anyway. And from that very moment, my life changed. And I started feeling the presence of Jesus tangibly every time I would call on him. And that was the only time when I, I would talk to God with my eyes open because I didn't know how to pray. And I would feel the presence of the Lord. Uh, I, closing eyes, I learned it in church when I started going to church. But I used to talk to God with my eyes open and I would feel the presence of the Lord, feel the room. And, and I used to think Christians used to experience that. So when I would share it with other Christians, I said, no, I've never felt that. <laughs> but what started happening now, everybody around me started saying, you carry special energy. When we're around you, we feel like we want to weep. Then I would tell them that, this has been happening when I spend time with Jesus. And I never planned to be a preacher or a minister or anything. I was just following the Lord. Then the more I shared the stories like this, the more miracles happened, the more people started getting, uh, they would call themselves, they are saved. I would even ask them, how did you get saved? He said, when you share that story, God saved me. I said, how? Even me, I start asking them what really happened because, I mean, I was just innocently just with that curiosity. I want to meet this Jesus that healed my sore throat. I want to meet this Jesus that visited me when I wanted to run away from him. And, and many people around the world, when they have asked me, he said, how do you know about Jesus? I said, you know what? I never studied God. I experienced God. And I can only tell you how I experienced him. He loves so deep, more than any man, more than anybody. God does not judge. He is always looking for a way to serve, to save somebody, to love on somebody. Even the most wicked people that we have forsaken, God is looking for a way to bring them back. We may want to curse them. We want to... We wanna, remove them in church, we want to do whatever, but God, God's heart is like, how can I bring them back? Many times I've had visions like that. I had visions like, uh, it would work me up. I remember one time I had this dream and a vision in the middle of the night where somebody was about to go to hell. I need to go and see them or else they're gonna go to hell this type of vision, like I would weep and I would go physically and knock to somebody's house. I said, I don't know you, but I had these dreams. Then the person said, I was just about to commit suicide. I said, really? Then I said, I had these dreams like three times. Then I would start weeping with that person. Then that person would feel the power of God. And before you know, I met him months later, He's like a minister of the gospel and said, oh yeah, I'm a minister of the gospel. I said, how did you become the minister of the gospel? That day when you visited me, when you came to knock on my house, Jesus visited my life. Then I was just being shocked. What? I do not take any credit for all these miracles because they are also a miracle to me. Some of them I don't even know he's doing it. I mean, people, even John, the one I came with, who was traveling with me, he tells me a lot of miracles that has happened just me simply by being with him. He has told me so many miracles, and I'm just listening, and I'm in shock, like, wow. Even today, I'm still surprised by the Lord. That's so amazing. <laughs> so I cannot really say, I did this, I did that. I just, it's the Lord did it. I cannot take any credit out of, out of it. Starting at nine years old. Yes. 
Healing Your Own Soul, Dr. Gershom Sakala is one book. Real quickly, so t talk about this delete offense. This book. came about, uh, I was asking God, I said, God, how can I get more closer than I am? And then the Lord said, you have to delete the offense. You need to teach people to delete the offense because a lot of people, they live in bitterness, they live in unforgiveness, and they own forgiveness. They feel they are entitled to be upset of somebody. They feel entitled to have a, a grudge against somebody. It says that people, those, that person does not know what you're going through. So you are actually blocking your, your own blessing. You are harming your own soul. So if people can forgive and let go, then I can answer every prayer. And, and it's also based on the true experiences of some actors who are against another actor. When I tell them, forgive that person, they would get a bigger movie role just like that. And there are some people that were struggling financially simply by forgiving a contractor that they have been holding grudges for 10 years, 30 years to say, oh, that person took away my money from me. I will never forgive them. It, it, it makes sense. You don't want to forgive them, but it is harming you and destroying you. The best way to do it is to do yourself a favor and make that bold decision to just let go and forgive and start living again. And, and, and it, it, that energy that you build around you of, of rejection and forgiveness, it is being felt when you're around people. People can feel that. And because of that energy, they cannot give you work. They cannot promote you. I've seen pastors and leaders and people of high profile that lost contracts. I mean about people who have lost millions and millions of money a, you know, it's not like a small thing, like a breaking a glass like that, then uh, that was a nice cup. No, I'm meaning about people that lost their live wood and, and, and they, they look at the person who caused that problem that is unforgivable. But actually, they are the, the one harming themselves without knowing because we were created to live in love we are love beings that's who we are and and somebody i read an article about a flower that somebody spoke about how much he or she loves the flower and the flower started to bloom and the same person took the same flower flower started saying how much he hates the flower the flower like this, the flower started to shrink and wither. So this is who we are as human beings. The more love we have around us, the more alive we become. So this book is to delete that offense and to make you alive again. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've had uh, believers, they were armed by a certain past and as a result, they don't want to serve the Lord because they are thinking that pastor did something so bad they cannot forgive and they cannot forgive God. So then the Lord taught me through this book how to learn to forgive God because God is a person. Actually, when they say, Lord, I forgive you for misunderstanding you, and God pours his love and gives them a revelation, illumination, like understanding the light comes. And they say, yeah, I don't have to, to stay in bondage. And many of, uh, there's one, one pastor she comes to a Bible study actually now. I didn't expect for her for things to happen like that because she's very influential. But she was calling a lot of bitterness against other believers and other leaders. And she felt, she felt like they deserved it to be not forgiven. She was the righteous one. She was right. But when I, I taught and delete the offense when she did that. She felt life retained on her and God's presence retained on her. That's all she needed is to forgive and to let go. So um, I've put the button there. You have to delete the button and start living again. And the second book I lot was not complete. 
it's about healing your own soul. So when you delete the offense, you need to heal your own soul. Why is your soul important? Your soul is your will, your emotions, and your feelings. And that's what makes up a human being. Your will is a place of decision. Your feelings are things that you hear and touch and see that come to you. So, if you're calling an offense or you are calling an forgiveness, it actually starts to eat up your soul. And, and as you begin to eat up your soul, your soul begins to be, starts to bring blockages on your, around your heart. It can even cause a physical heal, physical illness. You, you find that even your prayer life won't be effective. A lot of things. Trust issues with relationships as well. It just goes so much deeper. That's why the scripture says, as you prosper in your soul, may you also prosper in your health. So the true prosperity starts in a soul. In your will, the way you think, the decision you make. And, and, and your perspective of the way you feel things in emotions, they are all, uh, if, if they can accumulate either positive energy or a negative energy. You have heard about people say, protect your energy, right? Or protect, it's true. Your soul is the most precious part of your life that the enemy is after. The enemy is not after your body, it's not after your money, your influence or any of this is after your soul. And that's why televisions like this are very powerful. They were created to capture our soul, either for good things or for bad things. The images that our soul captures and a lot of things, they can control our will, then the way we feel and the way we respond. And, and this book and these two books are really to work on the entire human being to become to bring that wholeness. And then they, what will happen is they will feel like an open heaven. And what will happen is like everything they touch, they will begin to succeed, literally. The finances that were not coming, they will begin to come. I've seen people that were not making money for years. Once they, they, they allow that healing of the soul, they have that contract signed. They have promotion. All the people that I've been working with, even John, I, who you know came, I worked with him. Now he's a head of, he's, he's not just working as a normal person, he's a head. He's the main boss at his working place now at, at Calabasas. That's amazing. And I can tell you many, many practical testimonies how healing your soul is very important. Many pastors were not good teachers after this. They became good teachers. It's, it's, it's not just, you don't have to be a, really in positions of a minister. You can just be a normal business person. You know, that's why I like working with actors. I like working with CEOs. Now I've been working with some heads of states, actually, telling them how they can land the country. And I have these secret meetings with them and tell them simply to delete the offense and how to allow healing in their soul. And when they do that, they feel much more better and the fatigue in their body disappears. The crowd in their mind also disappear, disappears. They have a clear mind and, and things begin to work and they begin to love God. Again, that's the bottom line. Wow. Well, that's, that's amazing. What a story you have. Why did you come to America? Very interesting. Um, at the time I was in Cape Town, and uh, during that time, the Lord was asking me to leave Cape Town. He says, your time in Cape Town is over. And I was doing pretty good in Cape Town in terms of I was, I was in front of newspaper page, people writing stories. I was working with whoever you can mention, the biggest people in Cape Town. I was working with them in Cape Town, South Africa, and I was living in a very nice place. Then I'm hearing the Lord said, your time is over. And uh, I didn't know how to respond to that. Then I got an offer to go to Switzerland. 
then when I was about to receive that offer, I had a dream. And in this dream, I saw the elders in heaven. They came like this. They all put hands like in the soccer like this. They say, Gershom, we are sending you to America. Then I walk up like that. Then I, I've never been to America. I've never even researched much about America. Then I was doing a, a last meeting in Africa with my friend Michael W. Smith. I don't know if you know him, who is a musician, a great oh, guy. Yeah. So I invited him to Africa to come and do music, uh, so winning. Then he said he was doing Hallelujah tour for himself as well. Then I said, okay, we, I'll be a tour guy, but you can come to my meeting. So he came to my meeting, which we had thousands and thousands of people get set free. And while I was having a, a meal with Michael W. Smith, he said, God wants you to come to America. You should come to America. And, and then my, there was a, uh, another singer. She was with uh, the Jonas Brothers. She said, God is speaking to me that he wants you to come to America. Then I said, I'm going to Europe. I'm living on that. Then I felt that clear clarity in my head, but the offer in Europe was better. In America, I didn't get any offer of anything. Then I received some American missionaries. Then I offered them to stay in my house. Then while I'm washing plates, I was preparing a meal for them, and together with my friends and others were helping to cook, but I was washing plates as well. Then one of them said, why can't you come and celebrate the birthday in America? Then I said, mm, I'm not thinking about that, but I think I can make it happen. Then, um, then I, it was a month later, I, I came to America to celebrate my birthday. And then, during that time, our friend was dead. Her name is Emily, was dead. Not too far from here in, uh, in Aloyo Grande, uh, not too far from Santa Barbara. Then my friend said, I know God uses you in miracles, but you need, I cannot allow my friend to die. You have to raise her back from the dead. I didn't know how dead she was, but that's what they told me. Then I said, I'm here on vacation celebrating my birthday. <laughs> so we went to our home and I, I started singing. And um, not Emily, Amanda, that's an memory is another testimony. Um, Amanda got resurrected, whatever, if she was dead or she was here. But she said, I'm well. Then she said, can you come to my church? That's a vineyard church. I want to invite you and tell my pastor what God did, how you brought me back to life. So I go into that vineyard church. As I walked, the presence of Jesus was so strong on me. No one was coming near me. Everybody was coming near me, was shaking or falling down. Then I was like looking around like, what's going on here? <laughs> then the pastor who was in charge he ended up saying, we have heard what God has done. He has used you to bring our sister back to life. Can you pray for us? Then I said, no, I don't want to pray. They said, can you pray? I said, no, I don't want to pray. I, then eventually I prayed a short prayer. Then before, uh, after that, sorry, after that, they all said, can you come and minister officially? I said, I can, but maybe when I come back from Hawaii. So I went to Hawaii with the same friend, who invited me, we went to Hawaii for 10 days. Then in Hawaii there, I spoke for a man called Lauren Cunningham. Even there, I went for vacation, they made me teach for five days. <laughs> so I taught for Youth with a Mission Why I'm in, in, in Hawaii, in Kona, Hawaii, with a wonderful man who founded uh, Lauren Cunningham. Then I got interviewed on TBN by Matthew Crouch with his wife, Lori. Somebody said, we have this, this young man from Africa, you better interview him before, be, before it's too late. So they interviewed me and uh, I was on Praise the Lord, TBN. Uh, then I came back 
I preached in a vineyard, then I preached in a four square church, then I preached to different, and before you know, there were about 40 churches put together and I preached those ones. And, and before you know now, I started getting invited all over the place. So I would go to Africa and come back. And then one day the Lord said, I've, I've sent you to bring the move of God in Africa. I didn't even know, uh, sorry, in America. I said, how does it look like? He said, I want you to bring my spirit back into my church. So that's how I started moving from church to church, church to church. Then somebody gives me a prophecy, which I later received prophecies because uh, uh, God always speaks to me. I literally had people speak in my life. I wasn't raised that way. I'm a Bible guy, like yeah. whatever I get in the Bible is that. So somebody said, the Lord is calling you to be a father in Hollywood, to, to mother and father those actors. Then I said, but I don't even think about it. I didn't even think, I didn't even think about what it meant. Then later on, I met some actors. And then their lives got changed. And then I started, I developed a, a, a mental coaching with them, you know, what they go through, trauma and all that. And through prayer, they started, I started having a lot of results. And now I've got many of actors. Some of them, they live in Thousand Oaks and all over the place. I can't mention their names. So I have daily, I have weekly visits of actors and producers that are actually, I talk to them like in Hollywood and and you know last week I was just with one of the Oscar winner he lives around here he drove all the way to come and meet me that side so I have this type of opportunity now and then the Lord said there's a reason why I sent you to Hollywood because Hollywood captures souls through media and if you can change them you can bring so many souls into the kingdom. So this media is very powerful because the, the word media comes from the word medium. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a person that it speaks on behalf of someone. We are God's medium, right. but the devil also uses it That's right. to capture other people's right. souls, right. the images and all that. And so I love it what we're doing uh, in, in Hollywood. We have a lot of directors uh, from different departments, even from HBO and all that, all these people are under my mentorship. And it's a blessing mm. for me to be able to serve them. Incredible. It's wonderful to meet you. I don't, I don't even think I know what to say at this point. That's a stunning story. Um, GershomSakala.org. Um, we'll put that on your screen. Uh, you can go to GershomSakala.org. There's several other websites, but you can uh, start there. Uh, the book, Delete Offense, Healing Your Own Soul, and there's a couple others. Uh, I'm just honored. I'm honored to meet you. I'm honored as well, Dean, and, and it's a long time ago I told these stories. They started bringing the emotions back. No, it's, it's they started I don't bringing even, the feelings I need, back. I feel like I need to take the rest of the day off to process all this. I, I know, it's with. like, I, 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 it's amazing what God has done and Jesus appearing to you um, what a gift I, I'm thankful to him I don't know if I would, I would have saved him if I he didn't appear to me because I have this mind that questions everything yeah you know I don't know if you have that problem you know I'm, yeah, all, I'm, yeah. I'm a thinker I'm always yeah. like that's why I work well with actors and creative because we think process <laughs> yeah. things right. so if God does not come and intervene so now I know he's real and uh, I just came from San Francisco like two days ago and there was an Asian woman that could not hear for 10 years Jesus opened her death here she can hear and I was in uh, also in Las Vegas. The blind eyes would see. I don't do anything of these things. People ask me, do you fast a lot or pray a lot? <laughs> no, it just, they just follow me as I'm following Jesus. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Dean. Pleasure. Pleasure is mine. Dr. Gershom Sakala, what a story. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.